Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to Megger's monthly Testing Tactics webinar series. Today's topic is Battery Maintenance Load Testing, Standards, Requirements, and Recommended Practices. My name is Greg Valdez, and I'm the Marketing and Communications Manager for Megger. I'll be acting as the moderator for today's presentation and supporting you on any technical issues or questions for our presenter. On the right side of your screen, you will see a control panel that looks similar to this one. You can submit questions at any time during the presentation by typing in the box highlighted in red, and I will read the questions out during the Q&A segment at the end of the webinar. All webinar attendees are eligible to receive one NIDA CTD and one PDH or 0.1 CEUs for attending. You will receive this in an email within two business days of the webinar. That email will also include a copy of the PowerPoint presentation and a link to a video recording of this webinar if you'd like to watch it again or share it with your colleagues. Remember, you can ask questions at any time during the presentation and they will be answered at the end of the webinar during the Q&A session. Our, our presenter today is Boli Naranjo, Megger's Senior Applications Engineer. Also, to assist with the question and answer session, we will be joined by Sanket Bolar, our substation applications engineer. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us today, Volney. Thank you, Greg, and welcome to everybody to our seminar today. Uh, this is the agenda of the presentation we are uh, having today. We're gonna have an introduction. We're gonna have a slide about the standards uh, as a reference. And uh, well, then we're gonna start defining battery capacity. Uh, we are also going to define what is battery load testing. And uh, then we explain what is the rated battery capacity for then to then move on to the details of the capacity testing. That's gonna be the, the longest sec session, section of the presentation. And uh, to the end, we are gonna have the summary and then the the Q&A session. So <clears throat> to start, the, the batteries, well, they are a critical component of the electrical system, but they are a device that dies naturally. The life expectancy uh, is determined by the manufacturing process and the type of battery that you uh, get. And uh, usually for the vented lead acid batteries is uh, around 20 years for the valve regulated uh, batteries. Uh, it's around uh, 10, 15 years or even lower than, than the 10 years. And uh, all of these expectancy is seriously affected by the operating conditions. Just having a charger uh, not set correctly, uh, it's going to be affecting your, the life of the battery. Uh, temperature conditions, uh, uh, operating temperature operating conditions is going to be also a, a big factor in the in how long the battery is going to last, and also uh, the maintenance practices. Having good or bad maintenance practices is going to seriously affect your battery. And so we we require periodic or batteries require periodic maintenance and and testing to be able to achieve that expected life. Standards and industry practices have uh, several maintenance testing methods to determine uh, the condition of the battery and to determine if the uh, specifications of the battery are being met or if the, the quality of the batteries is, is really what uh, we uh, purchased or uh, to determine if the maintenance practices are being effective. Several of these methods are listed here. The float current, which is probably um, not the best way to do it, but it's, it's one of the methods that uh, it's uh, followed. Then you also have the ohmic testing, which is a very good method uh, and allows you to do the test anytime without any effect on the battery and provides you very good trending data. And then you have the capacity testing, uh, which is the one that we are talking today. This capacity testing, uh, also called load testing, is the only proven method to determine uh, the actual value of the capacity of the battery. 
It's also the only way to determine what the state of health of the battery or the only way to see what is the remaining life in the battery. The other methods are just uh, uh, an indication of what uh, could be that capacity and there's no direct correlation to from those methods to the capacity, to the actual capacity value of the battery. So it's, it's the best test that you can run on a battery. However, it is a very demanding test. Uh, you require sometimes very, very big load banks, or you need a lot of time, or you need a lot of preparation, and um, things can go wrong during the test. And running the test, again, it's not as easy as any other electrical test. So you need to start from scratch, from zero, uh, with the preparation and, and, well, some things you may not need to do, but, but it, it involves a lot of time. So understanding the test procedure, uh, preparing the battery and logistics are crucial for a successful test. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, the world of, of, the, of the batteries, uh, we have a lot of standards. Each type of battery has uh, its own standard and with recommended practices for, for the maintenance, for the installation, so um, that's what we can use for reference and, and it's uh, strongly recommended to follow those standards because uh, professionals have uh, met and, and um, put together these documents to uh, guarantee that you can do a very good maintenance. So everything um, is well explained in the standard and you have a lot of uh, guidance there. So each, uh, battery has its own document. Uh, we have the lead acid batteries uh, that, that is IEEE 450. Also for the valve regulated lead acid batteries, we have 1188. And uh, for nickel cadmium batteries, vented nickel cadmium, we have 1106. Those are the three type of batteries that we're gonna be uh, referring today uh, to uh, everything that I'm prepared for this presentation is related to, to these type of batteries without doing direct reference to them. It's mainly uh, everything that we have here in these slides will uh, relate to these batteries. And there are some notes there to distinguish between them. Also uh, in the references here, we have NERC PRC005 because it is a uh, basically a document that most of the utilities need to follow and it's a requirement. And uh, this uh, document or this requirement, this regulation, they uh, ask for, uh, in addition to other maintenance practices, uh, there's two tests that they allow to verify if the battery is performing to the uh, requirements of the substation. Uh, so this is the ohmic testing or the performance test or the modified performance test. So these two last tests, performance and modified performance, are capacity tests that we are gonna be talking today, uh, we're gonna be talking about today. So let's let's get into, into the battery load testing. The first thing to, to mention about uh, uh, or to define is the battery capacity. Uh, this is the amount of energy that a battery can store at any given moment during its life cycle. So the battery is manufactured to uh, meet certain capacity and that is defined by the manufacturer. And once the battery starts its life, it will um, deteriorate, it will degrade, and that capacity will degrade, uh, and it's going to be losing its uh, ability to store energy. And that's what we want to verify. This battery capacity is defined during the design process. So whenever the substation or whatever facility the battery is going to be supporting is being designed, the, the designer collects uh, a group of data, some, some data to be able to define what is going to be the capacity that is uh, going to be purchased. 
And uh, very important in this process is the duty cycle of the load. So the designer needs to know how the load is going to behave and how long is expected for the battery to support that load in case of a power failure. Also very important, the minimum voltage that the load can um, work with. Uh, and uh, this will also define the, the size of the battery and other factors as the operating temperature, the design margins, and of course, aging factors. All of these defines what is the size of the battery, what is the capacity of the battery that it's going to be installed for a facility. And um, as again, as this uh, battery ages, the capacity decreases, and this is where testing is required. We need to check if the battery is holding its capacity or if it's deteriorating or if the maintenance practices that we are performing are being effective or not. <clears throat> so the testing, um, again, the main test that you can perform on a battery to determine that capacity is, is, is running a, a load test. And um, there's three uh, reasons that you will perform the, the test. You will do uh, the test to determine if the battery meets the specification or the rating or both. Basically, you are measuring the capacity of the battery. And this is usually uh, when the battery is new, when you are accepting the, the battery, when you are installing the battery for the first time. From that point on, you can do the test uh, periodically to determine if the battery is uh, performing within the limits, uh, if it is capable to uh, support the load or to be able to determine if the capacity is deteriorating or not. And then another test you can perform or another reason you can perform is you don't, you might not be interested in the total capacity of the battery. You just want to know if the battery is capable to supply the load for the time that you need the load to be supplied. So that is uh, another reason you, you perform the test. So these, uh, Three type of tests they define, um, or these these reasons to test they define three type of or four type of tests, which are called the acceptance test, the performance test, the service test, and the modified performance test. And these um, will uh, provide the capacity except the service test. The service test is uh, only a test that can verify the ability to meet the duty cycle of a battery. In this presentation, we're going to be talking mainly about the acceptance and the performance test, which we are defining uh, now. So the, the acceptance test, uh, it's, it's an approval test of the battery capacity. Uh, it can be performed at the manufacturer facility or on site after the installation, right after the installation, usually is performed in the very first uh, six months of uh, once the battery has been delivered and installed and it's uh, been under floating conditions for a while. So the, the battery capacity has developed fully and um, that is when the test is performed to, to accept and to also get a benchmark value. Uh, you want to know what is the capacity uh, that the battery is oh, starting sure. with. Mm. The battery should uh, be prepared uh, and inspected with all the recommendations that are in the standard. And uh, as, as the result of the, of the test, the battery could uh, be at least, or should be at least 90% of the rated capacity. And this could be because, uh, uh, again, the, the capacity of the battery is still developing and um, has not totally formed uh, so this value is, is accepted, but at least should be 90%, should not be below that. And of course, it can be higher than 100%. And as a matter of fact, it, it usually will be like that. It will be higher than 100%. And whatever result is obtained can be used as the baseline for the trend. Then uh, we have the performance test. Uh, this is a test that uh, you do uh, basically as a, as a maintenance test to, to determine if the battery is holding its capacity and it's aging as it should be and it's not having accelerated aging. 
The test should be made within the first two years of service, and uh, then it should be performed periodically from this point on. The, the interval, the test interval, should not be greater than 25% of the expected service life. So um, we have another slide that shows an example or, or depicts this better, but if the battery is expected to, be, uh, to last for 20 years, well, the expectation is to test uh, every 25%, that means every five years. Um, the duration of the test, uh, we want to discharge the battery or we want to apply the load to the battery uh, for a duration that is similar to the duty cycle of the battery. So we are not going to mimic or to um, do exactly the, the duty cycle of the battery. We're gonna, not gonna repeat that, but we want to have a duration that is similar to what the battery is supposed to supply. Uh, they, these will totally guarantee that the battery, that the result that we are getting is, is, is the right result. Um, <clears throat> once uh, the battery shows degradation, uh, for example, the battery capacity drops more than 10% from the previous test, we need to start testing annually. Or whenever the battery has reached 85% of the expected service life, then we should also start doing the test uh, annually uh, because from this point on, the battery is expected to drop faster in capacity than it does in the uh, previous years, on the early years of the battery. So if there's like a knee point in the behavior of the capacity of a battery, it starts degrading and then it reaches a point where it starts dropping very fast. And that is expected to be around the 85% of the life of the battery. This value is the one that we trend and uh, also uh, it's an indicator of the maintenance. If we see that the battery is degrading faster, uh, probably the maintenance practices are not good or the operating conditions are not good. And uh, this, this can um, evidence the uh, situation easily, or it could also be an indication of um, um, the battery uh, manufacturing process that might not be the, the best. So always try to look for, for a very good battery when you, you install something in your substation or your facility. The battery needs to be prepared for a performance test, and um, depending on uh, what you are doing, if you're trending for capacity or you want to reflect the maintenance uh, uh, practices, you want uh, to prepare or to not fully prepare the battery for the test. So that's uh, uh, some slides ahead, and we're gonna touch more on the, on the preparation of the battery. The other two tests, the service test, uh, it is um, a test that is scheduled at uh, the discretion of the user of the owner. It's like an audit, a surprise audit on the battery. And uh, that's the reason there's no schedule defined for these. And it's a test that has to be uh, performed uh, in the as found condition. So no previous maintenance, no uh, previous uh, preparation procedure, and the test has to be performed with the duty cycle, or the, the idea is to uh, profile the load to mimic the actual duty cycle of the battery or as close as possible. In this um, slide, we're seeing like a typical profile that comes from, this is uh, an image from the actual uh, IEEE 485 that uh, specifies how to uh, calculate or size the battery. And, and this is an example they have there for a, for a load profile. And the table that it's next to it, it shows uh, the different loads that we would have to consider. And, um, and the battery is supposed to be able to uh, meet those requirements whenever you have uh, continuous load, a permanent continuous load, that should be able to supply it. And whenever non-continuous or momentary loads, um, 
are required from the battery, the battery should supply them. And, and that's what you're trying to, to achieve with that test. And then the modified performance test is a, it's a test that can do both. It will do the, the profile and then it will continue once the profile uh, section or the, the duty cycle section of the test has finished, then it, the test is continued with a constant current as from the manufacturer's uh, tables, and then you uh, get the capacity. So you are verifying both aspects, the, the, the duty cycle, and you're getting the capacity value of the battery. This test is a little bit more complicated than the other ones, and um, you need to include aging factors in the uh, calculation of the rate, uh, the discharge rate, and, uh, well, I suggest that you uh, refer to IEEE 450 for specific details for these. There are three types of modified performance tests. So we are not covering this one here. We'll need more time for this. Any, any load testing, periodic load testing will provide um, uh, an immediate demonstration of the battery capacity or the ability. You get the result and uh, you can use that to, to trend or to define some uh, corrective actions. The, these recommended practices are, are best suited for uh, the type of, for different type of batteries, battery applications and installation conditions. And, and sometimes it's not possible to follow all of these gu uh, guides and all of these recommendations. The, the test is, as I said, is demanding, and sometimes you cannot uh, comply with everything that is in the standard. So um, if you consider or if you, if you need, you may uh, use alternate methods or you can introduce variations for, to the recommendations. However, there's two things to consider. First, uh, if you need to follow or you need to comply with NERC, NERC only allows performance, modified performance, or ohmic tests for lead-acid batteries. And for nickel-cadmium batteries, it only allows the, the performance or the modified performance test. So uh, in that case, you really don't have too much uh, space to, to introduce alternate methods or, or do some variations of of these recommendations because, well, NERC um, indicates that you should follow IEEE uh, for, for the tests. And then, um, again, if you have some variations or you use any alternative methods, uh, the rate duration, if, if you select a rate duration that it's not uh, including the actual duty cycle, so basically it has to be, um, similar or uh, higher than the duty cycle duration, then the performance of the battery may not be fully demonstrated. The other way to say this is that short duration tests will not predict the long duration performance and vice versa, long duration tests will not predict short duration performance. And uh, the, the reason uh, for this is that uh, at high rates of discharge, when you use very high currents to discharge and, and try to, you want to try to make a short test, then the ohmic value of the cells and the interconnections will affect greatly the performance of the battery. So there's an efficiency factor in the cells that should be considered when selecting the rate of discharge. Okay, so we already defined uh, battery capacity, and now we need to see this from the perspective of the manufacturer, the, the rated battery capacity. We already talked about the capacity that is needed in the substation and, and what we need to uh, do to verify this capacity. But then when we purchase a battery or when we get to a battery, we need to know what its rated capacity. Uh, this is a value that is assigned by the manufacturer to the manufacturing process. Uh, and this is a value that is uh, given for uh, 
a specific temperature and to a specific end of discharge voltage. So any manufacturer will have what it's called the, the discharge tables. And um, here you're going to see, as, as we, you can see here in this slide, that there's a, a voltage per cell. And uh, let me turn on my pointer here. So you have a voltage per cell. That's the lowest voltage that the battery should be discharged to. It's also called end voltage, terminal voltage. And uh, this voltage is uh, also, or this table is also referred to a temperature, 25 degrees C. This means that if the battery is not operating at this temperature, it's not going to guarantee these values that are given in the table. Um, the rate, rated capacity of a battery is given in amp hours. And for example, a battery that has a 800 amp hour as, as a rating, that means that this battery can deliver 100 amps continuously for eight hours. And uh, well, you would think that um, this can be, uh, that this will be a, a linear ratio. Well, it, it is not a linear ratio. It doesn't mean that uh, the battery can do 200 amps for uh, four hours, which will be also 800. This, is, this doesn't happen with the batteries. You can see here with this example, for eight hours, it can deliver uh, 100 amps. So that will be 800 amps hour. However, for four hours, it can only deliver continuously 176 amps which is less than a total of 800. So uh, the tables have to be followed uh, to be able to get the actual capacity. To get an accurate value, we need to follow the tables and we need to be sure uh, that we, the, the battery is operating at that temperature. And if not, we need to use a correction factor. And we're gonna see that uh, later on in the presentation. This uh, rated battery capacity is uh, also another way to define it is that it is the ability to deliver current at a specified rate. So the capacity testing that we have been mentioning a lot, uh, it's actually discharging the battery at a constant current using that current from the manufacturer's table or at a constant power, the tables are also provided in, in terms of, of watts instead of amps. But the idea is that if you're running the test to determine the capacity value of the battery, it has to be performed at a constant current or constant power. And um, you need to measure the time that the voltage takes to reach the end of discharge voltage that we mentioned previously. So these 1.75 um, volts per cell times the amount of cells. So if you have a, a battery that is 60 cells and um, uh, the voltage, the end voltage is 1.75, means that you need to run the test down to um, 105 volts. And if you have a 24 cell battery, a VLA battery, then um, you have 24 cells times 1.75. That means you need to run the battery down to 42 volts, like in this example. And once uh, the battery reaches that uh, point, well, we, we have the time and we also uh, stop the test. The test has to be stopped there. The, the voltage cannot go beyond that if not the cells will be uh, affected in its chemistry and its capacity and probably won't be able to recover that. So the, the capacity calculation uh, actually compares the time that it took for the battery to reach that voltage and uh, it compares that to the expected time from the battery manufacturer's published ratings. Uh, the, this ratio is, um, is the, the capacity. 
So here you see uh, the formula from the IEEE uh, standard. You have TA, which is the, the actual time of the test. You have uh, TS, which is the expected time. And I mentioned a correction factor uh, for temperature. So here's the correction factor for that temperature. And, and we're gonna see the table also later. Uh, that uh, table that contains the correction factors. Mm, and here we can see, for example, the uh, ba a battery in a condition, new condition, uh, should last for 10 hours. And then during this test, it lasted for eight. That means that the uh, battery uh, has an 80% of capacity. That's uh, the basic concept about the capacity calculation. It's a, re it's a ratio between the actual time and the expected time with a temperature correction. Now, this is uh, one of the methods to calculate the capacity, and it's called the time-adjusted method. Mm, the formula that I just showed is, is, is that one, the time-adjusted method. There's another method, which is called the rate-adjusted method, which we are not going to cover today. Uh, the time-adjusted method is, is kind of the typical test that, uh, or the typical method that is used for tests higher than one hour, longer than a one hour of duration, or one hour or and longer. The rate adjusted method should be used for tests that are less than one hour. Uh, however, the rate adjusted method can be used for any, any type of test and, uh, and for any duration. And actually it's a, a bit more accurate than the time adjusted method. However, that method is more complicated. You need to consider correction factors. So that's why it is not that common. So um, no matter what method is used, um, the recommended practice is to replace the battery if the capacity reaches 80% or, or is below 80% the manufacturer's rating. And whenever this replacement is required, the standard allows for or um, gives one year for the replacement. So basically you find out that your battery reached that value and you start working on the uh, purchasing process and well, you have one year. Uh, the reason for this, again, remember I already mentioned the capacity of the battery will have a knee point where it starts dropping faster as it ages. So uh, there's not too much time to uh, make any correction or to replace the battery. So you should uh, start working uh, on this soon. So here's the, the example or the, the slide that depicts the testing schedule. The uh, idea is that you perform an acceptance test uh, at the facility or at the manufacturer's facility or at the uh, site once it is installed and uh, around the, the time of installation, uh, usually somewhere between installation point and six months. And then uh, within the first two years of the life of the battery, you, per, you run the performance test. You run another capacity test. And from that point on, you perform the test every 25% of the life of, of the battery. That means if you have a 20-year a battery, a battery that is expected to last for 20 years, you would perform the test uh, at two years of age and then at the fifth year, then, um, sorry, at the seventh year, five years more, so seven years and then at 12 years, and then uh, at 17 years of the battery. And from that point on, you start testing annually because it, it is around the 85% of the life of the battery. So uh, you will do uh, probably five or six tests on, on a battery throughout its life. So that's a uh, uh, thing that you will hear that the capacity test is destructive. Well, it, it's 
because it's taking life out of the battery. Really, you are just taking seven cycles throughout the entire life. Um, and, and batteries are designed for a much bigger amount of cycles. So really, you're not taking too much out of the battery. Um, another reason that could be considered destructive is because, uh, well, if you don't handle the test properly and you don't stop the test when the battery reaches the end voltage, it, uh, it will affect the battery. But it's not the, the test itself is destructive. If you don't, if you're not careful running the test, you could of course damage the battery. But it's it the test itself is it's not destructive. It's the same with insulation test. If you apply a very high voltage to an insulation that is not rated for for that voltage, of course you're going to break down the the voltage the the insulation. So it's it's matter of good practices and good handling of of the test and and, and the the elements that you use for the test. So the procedure for the test, how you, uh, how you prepare the battery and what procedure you need to follow. So the battery definitely needs preparation. I always say that it's like running a marathon. This battery is going to show you how much it can do. And uh, well, uh, you want it to be prepared and to be in good condition. So you need to perform maintenance and uh, you also need to do some preparation steps that we're gonna see in the next slides. The other thing that you need to consider as part of your procedure is that the battery is going to be unavailable during and after the test for a certain amount of time. And uh, this unavailability might affect the, the resources or the, um, the time that you can uh, run the test or that you have available for the test and might uh, also require some backup for your battery or for your, your facility, for your substation. To perform the test, you need the, the discharge table. So you need to know what are the recommended uh, manufacturer discharge rates. You need to define what's going to be your, your time uh, for running the test. You need to measure the temperature before starting the test. You need to consider uh, your load bank, the test instrument that you're going to be using. You need to calculate that, how big it's going to be. And you need to perform some voltage measurements uh, before the test and during the test. So here's the, the IEEE recommended procedure. Uh, first of all, you need to equalize. Now, uh, here you need to check with your manufacturer, battery manufacturer, if the battery uh, should be equalized. And this applies especially for the VRLA battery. So VRLA batteries, they, they should not be equalized uh, with the similar conditions or under the same procedures as the vented lead acid battery. So check the manual or contact your battery manufacturer to see what is the recommendation about equalized process. Um, and if the battery is equalized, it needs to float for a minimum of 72 hours prior to running the test. This uh, means that if you need to start the test or, or you need to rerun the test again for any reason, um, then you have to wait for the battery to reach the, the fully charged condition. And once uh, it reaches that condition, then it ha you have to wait for 72 hours for it to float, and then you can run the test. This is uh, one step that uh, if you want to reflect your maintenance practices, if you want to see if the battery is, is really uh, having a, the, the, the capacity that you are expecting due to the maintenance procedures, you, you want not to equalize, you want to skip this process. The second step is to check the battery connections. So you want to check uh, all the terminal resistances, the strap resistances, and uh, you want to perform maintenance on this if you see something that it's not good. Um, now, if you just want to see how your maintenance procedures are, 
uh, affecting or, or improving your battery, probably you don't want to do this prior to the test because you want to see how things are in, in real life, not with a battery fully prepared. Then uh, you need to record all the floating conditions, uh, float current, float voltage of each cell. You also need to record all the electrolyte conditions in, uh, well, this applies for VLA batteries, for vented lead acid batteries or for vented batteries, because this could apply also to NICAT batteries. Um, and this is the moment that you determine what is the temperature of your battery. And this is, remember, this is a value that is important for the capacity uh, correction factor. So, uh, and if this is a VR lay battery, you should take that temperature from the negative post of the battery. Then uh, measure the battery flow voltage. So now, before it was in step number three, it was the the float voltage of each cell, you also want to measure the float voltage uh, of the entire string of the battery at the terminals of the battery. And then you start uh, getting ready to disconnect the charger and to, uh, if you are connecting a backup, uh, then this is the moment that you do that and you take all the precautions to avoid any, any disconnection of critical loads and you try to to perform, uh, to follow all your internal procedure to avoid any any problem with the with the system. And at this point, the the battery you can disconnect the charger and do the connection of the instrument to perform the test, and the battery is ready for testing. So as you can see, there's like a like a very detailed process to get the battery ready for testing, and uh, if anything goes wrong, well, you need to probably go through all of those steps or most of those steps again, and again, that's going to represent time. The connection of a load bank, well, it depends on what load bank you have here. This slide is showing our Torquil 900, which is a, a load bank, that the load bank that we offer for, for this type of test. And uh, <clears throat> it is also showing the connection of individual cell voltage monitoring. This uh, will monitor the voltage of each cell throughout the, the test and uh, on top of the overall voltage that the torquil is monitoring. So it's a, it's a simple connection and um, you get a lot of information from this kind of setup. This uh, shows the discharge results, it's a quick uh, slide, uh, it's a slide with uh, kind of a basic information I wanted to put there just to show how the result will show once you finish the test. And, and of course, this is not the entire report. I'm just putting the highlights here. Basically, you get the, the voltages, the numeric values, um, you get the, the flow voltage, open total voltage, start voltage, and the end voltage which is very important. Remember, you want not to damage the battery by going below the end voltage recommended by the manufacturer. And of course, you get your measured capacity, you get the corrected capacity and, and the corrected percentage capacity. Uh, you can see also there the total duration of the discharge and any pause time. If, you, if the test was interrupted or there was any, any pause during the test, it will show there and, and you will see that also in the graph. We, we have some examples or one example later on. So I, I showed the connection and I showed the result, but there's a lot of things in between that. Uh, you need to define your discharge rate. You need to, to select your discharge rate. So we already mentioned that, um, well, you need to use the tables, but um, the, the fact that you have several options there, you have one hour, in this case, 1.5, two, three, four, five, eight hours options, and you even have minutes options. It doesn't mean that you can use these uh, interchangeably between tests or that you can uh, select one of these rates arbitrarily. 
you as again very important you need to look or to mimic or to look for a duration that uh, includes or envelopes the uh, duration of the duty cycle uh, and these will uh, define your preparation your logistics and resources so if you select a very high rate well this means that you need a very big bank and uh, remember that that is also going to affect your result. Uh, higher rates will mean uh, less efficiency of the battery. Also, uh, if you are getting prepared for the test, you need to consider the availability. Uh, you might have, if you don't have all the means, you might have the load totally offline, or you might have that depending just on the charger, <clears throat> while the battery is operate uh, is being tested, but if something happens, then you lose the charger and you don't have a backup, or you have to consider a backup. So these are things that um, add a, a cost to the test and also all of the preparation and the resources that you need to consider. Mm, short duration rates, you need a big bank, a, a bigger load bank, you need a good cables and terminals for the connections, and you need to consider ventilation or installing the load bank outside the, the, the battery room. If you have long duration test, uh, low rate test, this will uh, um, conflict with the availability of the system or you need to bring a backup. And of course you need higher man hours to perform the test. So there's, there's a trade off here when you select the rate but especially, it's not really that you can select from, from any value. You need to select according to the duty cycle of the battery. So the performance of the battery, when you select that rate selection, when you do the rate selection, um, you are going to be affected by the battery efficiency. And um, the other thing is that once a duration and a rate is selected, it should be used for the life of the battery. So the test uh, every every five years or whatever um, periodicity you select, you should run the test with the same rate. Uh, so that that is something to consider as well, that you always going to need to have the same resources to be able to run that test. And um, that is going to affect your, your cost. So if you're considering a temporary backup, uh, this is a couple of the things that I've seen. Um, I have three examples of what I've seen as, as temporary backup. So this is the simplest one that I've seen. It's made out of uh, car batteries. And uh, this is something that they bring in a, in a truck and they put it together. They have the jumpers. Uh, to, to set up everything here and then the cables from the battery are run to a disconnect switch. So this is not so improvised. This is something that they have already considered in their design. The, the transfer switch is here. And um, from this box, they can connect the new battery or put it, put it in parallel with the existing battery and then remove the the battery to be tested from the system and the substation doesn't see any, any problem there or any, any uh, variation. So this is a very simple and, and quick and, and very low cost solution. Uh, then you can have something more elaborated, but still a little bit of homemade, uh, still with batteries from car batteries and, and, the, and a charger mounted on a little pickup truck. And you can see there also that there's the load bank that they use to test the, the battery at the facility. And there's a little bit of a switch uh, uh, box here or connect, um, some protection here. It's a homemade solution, very simple, but very, very effective. And then you have a more industrial or professional uh, solution, a trailer with um, everything with very good specs and good design, considering many aspects from uh, multiple batteries, uh, 
good batteries um, in um, not or, or batteries according to the to the application that they have in in this case they have two chargers here and they have gas monitoring they have ventilation and the trailer also includes the uh, load bank so uh, it's a more professional solution and you can see from here that you can manage some of the of the costs of these uh, solutions also, when you're running the test, you need to consider the temperature. Remember that the batteries are specified for a certain temperature, usually 25 degrees C. I've seen also uh, batteries specified to 20 degrees C. How, whatever it is, you should always get your temperature before running the test. At the beginning of the test, you should know what is the temperature of the battery, not of the room. And then that should be used for the uh, for the correction of the result. Um, when you are reviewing the results, you should always look for for that uh, temperature of the battery, and you should confirm that uh, the result was corrected for for that temperature. The IEEE includes those tables for you to correct. Here we have an the example of the table for the uh, vented lead acid batteries, and this is for the time uh, corrected method. Also, during the test or even before starting the test, you need to determine the voltages of the battery, of the terminals of the battery. Uh, and we recommend doing these uh, throughout the, the different stages that you see when running the test. So you get there, the charger still connected, so the battery is floating. You want to measure the voltage, the floating voltage. Uh, then uh, you disconnect the charger and there's a time there that lapses between you disconnect the charger and you start the test for the connections and getting everything set up. So that's uh, that that time the, vol the battery is being without any um, float voltage there, there, it's not being charged anymore, and um, that is what it's called the open circuit voltage. This voltage might, uh, depending on the condition of each cell, the cells might uh, drop a little bit or might drop a lot in the voltage, and this is an indication that the battery uh, might fail during the test, so you want to take some provisions for this to, to be uh, avoided, or you can decide not to run the test um, because of this voltage situation. So here we see uh, a result, a typical result again, the discharge curve and uh, the different voltages at the, or the, the voltages at different stages. Here, another example, um, and this includes a pause. So the standard allows for pause uh, for a pause uh, in the test, especially to do a bypass of a cell to remove a cell from the from the string because this cell might be failing. Uh, so when you pause the test, the battery is going to rest, let's say, and it's going to recover a little bit of the voltage, and basically it's recovering a little bit of the capacity. So if you pause the test for uh, for a long time, you're going to affect your result and it's not going to be an accurate result. So that's why the pause is monitored. And in this result, we can see that the test was paused for almost two minutes. And you can see the effect of that here. So just with two minutes, the voltage went higher and it takes a while to return to the, to the previous voltage. So it's extending the time that the battery can run, which means that it is extending or increasing the capacity of the battery. So uh, I just mentioned bypassing a cell. So the, the, not all of the cells discharge equally. Um, depending on the condition uh, of the cell or depending on the charging, con on the charge condition of the battery, the the cell might run longer or, or faster or out of capacity. So 
you uh, want to monitor each of the voltages or, or the individual cell voltages. Uh, the recommendation is to, again, to measure the float voltage of each cell. And uh, during the test, at least uh, to have three more sets of measurements at the beginning, at the completion, and, and during the test, any time during the test. However, um, the idea is that it's preferable to do a continuous measurement of each cell, and that's why manufacturers have these individual monitoring um, devices. And uh, by doing this, you could identify if a, if a cell has a reduced capacity, and you can make some decisions from those measurements. So here we see uh, the discharge curve for uh, 24 cells. You can see that there's no variation. All of the cells discharge almost equally, and uh, they have a very, very similar um, pattern of discharge. Uh, that means that it's a very healthy battery. In this case, uh, we see a little bit of difference, and we start seeing some cells that are deviating, not showing uh, the same pattern. They are going discharging faster, and you can see that some of them will discharge um, uh, will have the same pattern at the beginning. Uh, others will be totally different from the beginning. And uh, the ones that are the same, you can see that they start deviating or uh, differentiating throughout the test. So uh, this helps you to determine, again, if there's uh, any problem with individual cells. And here we have another, another example, and this is a more critical example. You can see that uh, there's uh, three or four cells that are having serious issues here, that they are dropping the voltage very fast while the other ones are still with very good voltage there, with very good capacity. So definitely it's something that uh, helps a lot to determine the condition of the cells. And um, it's actually uh, critical to decide if you need to bypass a cell uh, during the test. And this is something that is, uh, uh, allowed and it in some cases is required or, or needed. The reason to bypass a cell is uh, to avoid further damage of the cell or to avoid negative contribution to the test, which is basically a polarity reversal. The, the voltage can go so low that uh, it will reverse its polarity and start will start being a load instead of being a source inside the string. For the, for the test. Then um, this bypass should be considered if the cell voltage approaches the polarity reversal, which is around plus one volt, or if it goes below that. And when the cell is bypassed, uh, the overall battery and voltage should be recalculated. You are uh, removing a little bit of voltage from that end voltage, so you need to recalculate it. For the VLA and the VRLA batteries, um, it is uh, not required if the test is beyond 90% of the expected time. But if this happens early in the test, the cell should be removed and bypassed with a jumper. And this means that if you can, because you have very short time, you should uh, uh, not exceed more than 10% of the duration of the test or, or six minutes, which, wh whichever is, is shorter. So you should be prepared for this. You should, if you suspect that a cell will be failing during the test, you should have a jumper and run this procedure uh, with all the safety precautions to avoid any, any harm or any damage to the, to the operator or to the technicians, and also to avoid uh, interrupting the test farther than it is, because then, if not, you're going to have to start again from, from the beginning, and, and including all the preparation time. Uh, the NICAT batteries, they are not damaged by the polarity reversal, so no need to bypass the cell during a test. However, the if the cell goes beyond that, um, minimum voltage or that end voltage established by the manufacturer, and if it goes into polarity reversal, then the end voltage still needs to be recalculated. So you don't need to stop the test, but you need to recalculate the, the, 
the end voltage of the of the test. So this is um, pretty much uh, all the material we wanted to show today. Uh, as a summary, the the battery load testing is the only proven method to accurately measure the capacity and and determine the state of health of the battery. You need a lot of balance between the resource and and time for the test and. Uh, and again, it can be it can turn into a cumbersome and a complicated test if you don't if you are not well prepared. Um, you have very good references for for the for the test. Um, IEEE has a, a document for each battery, so it's strongly recommend to to review these documents and to know them well. Mm, there's uh, also a great amount of information that is logged during the test, uh, specifically if individual cell voltages are recorded. Pay attention to these voltages. Don't uh, just go and analyze the percentage capacity of the battery. There's more to analyze beyond that uh, value. Um, when reviewing the results, uh, carefully check for the average temperature and confirm the use of a correction factor and um, always compared to previous results to determine degradation of the battery uh, and verify that uh, the tests were performed with the same rate so you can actually compare results. If not, the comparability is it's going to be difficult to, to achieve. Uh, review all of your voltages in the test report and um, understand and use the manufacturer's tables correctly. So with this, we conclude the, the actual technical presentation. Uh, last portion of the presentation is the, to show the recommended equipment or, that we have for this uh, test. So as a load bank, we have Torquil 900, an instrument that you can use to run any of the tests that we mentioned today. You can do performance tests, modified performance tests. Uh, it will give you the capacity value. It will actual uh, even log the battery charging process. Once you completed the test, it can be left there connected to monitor how the battery charges. The maximum dissipation uh, factor, maximum dissipation power of the unit is 15 kilowatts. And um, if you need more dissipation, uh, you can expand the system by adding extra loads, which are called the TXLs. Then uh, for the individual voltage monitoring, we have the VVMs, which uh, are uh, a set of uh, a string of uh, little boxes that you connect on, on each cell, and they will automate the battery voltage measurement, and uh, they are connected uh, daisy chained. Uh, you can measure up to 240 cells, and you can measure strings of up to 600 volts. Uh, so it's a very flexible system that you can use for many uh, applications and you actually can use the VVMs independently uh, without the load bank, uh, the Torquil. And all of these, uh, we have PowerDB software that will uh, collect all your information, will create database, you can do trending and you can do asset organization, you have all of the reporting capabilities there and you can, if you uh, have a compliance um, to meet, then you can do, you can have a compliance scheduler in the software as well. Well, thank you so much. And Greg, now I turn to you so you can uh, uh, give the, inf the last information from these slides and also then we will go to the Q&A session. All right. At this time, the presentation portion of the webinar is officially concluded. Uh, we'll now take 30 minutes to answer uh, as many of your questions as possible. If you have any questions, please submit them now into the Q&A box on the right side of your screen. For those that are leaving, when you close the webinar window, a survey will pop up on your screen. We would greatly appreciate it if you could take a couple of minutes to provide your feedback so we can continue to improve upon future webinars. On the survey, there is a field where you can also request a demo or quote on any of our mega products. Again, a copy of this presentation, along with a link to the video recording of this webinar, will be emailed to everyone in about a week. Oh. Um, you can also view uh, recordings of pre previous webinars on our website at us 
dot megger dot com forward slash webinars and register for next month's webinar dielectric frequency response and analysis of IEEE guide C57.161. The presenter will be Dr. Diego Robolino, Megger Principal Engineer. Now let's get to your questions. is, what are your thoughts on lithium ion batteries to replace lead acid battery? And are they safer than lead acid types? Okay, so le uh, lithium ion batteries, definitely they are new technology that it's, they are starting to, to uh, show and in different installations, different facilities. The cost of these batteries is still a little bit prohibitive for the substation uh, world or substation application. However, we are starting to get calls on customers uh, asking how to test these batteries. Uh, related to uh, capacity testing, they, the, the test will be the same as we just described uh, um, in, the, in the general concept. We want to discharge the battery uh, down to a minimum voltage and check if it is giving us the capacity that uh, it is in the nameplate or how that capacity is degrading. So uh, in, in regards of uh, how is that going to be uh, working for the substations and if they are going to replace them, well, there's still a long run for that. The lead acid batteries are still uh, good in regards to capacity. They are still good in regards to uh, many other technical aspects, but especially on the price side. So uh, probably for other applications, but not for substations yet. All right, so for our next question, uh, one of our utility clients rejects to perform a battery capacity discharge test for uh, flooded lead acid batteries with the argument that the test is damaging the batteries. Do you have any experience or comment about that? So um, this we touched uh, about on, on the presentation. However, I wanted to, to answer these again because uh, it's a very common question. It's a very common concern. Uh, the test uh, is considered destructive uh, for, several, for a couple of reasons. One is that every time you discharge the battery and depending how deep you go in the discharge, uh, you are taking a cycle out of the battery. So the same way that the batteries are spec for uh, time, um, for a certain uh, life expectancy in regards to the years, there's also a certain spec or there's a spec there for the cycles on the battery. So uh, every time you take a, ba a cycle out of the battery or you cycle the battery, you are taking a little bit of the life of the battery. However, uh, depending on the amount of cycles that the battery has available, you, you will not be uh, damaging the battery. The other reason that the test is considered destructive is if you go below the minimum voltage or the end voltage uh, specified by the manufacturer, then the chemistry is going to be affected. And in that case, you are definitely going to affect the ability of the cap of the battery to hold the uh, energy. So you're affecting the capacity. But as I mentioned during the presentation, if you handle the test properly and you do the things in the correct way, you're not going to be affecting the battery. So that, that is very important. Um, do not go beyond the minimum voltage or the end voltage. And uh, following the testing schedule, that we mentioned every 25% at least, uh, then you're not testing the battery that often that you're gonna be taking too many cycles. So in the end, it's as any other test in the electrical world that if you don't use it correctly, you can destroy the equipment, but if you use it correctly, it's going to be a safe test and, and it's not gonna be affecting your battery. All right, the next question. Uh, can you explain the statement about test interval should not be greater than 25 percent? Uh, hi, Sanket here. So the uh, test interval refers to the time between test 
and what what we are referring to when we say 25 percent we say 25 percent of service life uh, service life is the life for which the battery is expected to be in operation and that's provided by the manufacturer typically it varies uh, from model to model but it's typically in the range of 10 to 20 years uh, so you can look at the manufacturer's specs and find out about the service life and based on that you can decide how often you want to run the test until you see the capacity uh, the capacity degrading all right next question why is ANSI slash NIDA chosen to remove guidance on cell internal ohmic values for vended nickel cadmium batteries in MTS 2019 part 7.18.1.2 the 2015 standard contains specific guidance so I don't know exactly or don't know the exact reason for these. Uh, one characteristic of nickel cadmium batteries is that um, different than the uh, lead acid batteries, the nickel cadmium won't not, will not dissolve into the electrolyte as the lead acid does in, the, in these type of batteries. So uh, most of the failure modes that can be detected in the uh, lead acid batteries because the uh, active material, the lead is dissolving into the electrolyte and changing the uh, ohmic value. Uh, this is not going to be able to be detected that easily in the nickel cadmium batteries. There's a few failure modes in nickel cadmium batteries that uh, will definitely affect the ohmic value of the cell but it's not going to be uh, many of them and um, and the actual main interest of the ohmic testing is to uh, determine the the aging or the loss of capacity of the battery uh, or try to correlate that in a certain way to to the to the ohmic value so uh, in these uh, nickel cadmium batteries that doesn't happen and a nickel cadmium battery definitely can show uh, 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 an increased ohmic value when it is out of capacity or when it's uh, already a battery that it's not uh, good anymore. However, this is not going to be always. You could have a battery under that condition with no capacity or, or in very bad condition, but the ohmic value is going to be uh, the same as when it was new. So uh, it's not such a reliable test for nickel cadmium on, on, on certain cases. Uh, so I guess that's my, my thinking about uh, why they remove it from there. Uh, thank you. All right, next question. If the battery is operated at elevated temperatures and the life of the battery has to be reduced, is the expected service life also reduced? Should the annual performance test be done when this new expected service life is reached? The service life that's provided by the manufacturer is provided on the basis that the batteries will be operated at, at 25 Celsius or at a standard temperature. Uh, temperature plays a major role in the life of the battery. Uh, if, if, it's, if, it's a, uh, if the batteries are stored at a low temperature, then that slows down the, the chemical process in the battery. If they're operated at a high temperature, then that causes deterioration in the battery and the service life is reduced, as, as you said. Uh, but I don't think it's, it's possible to get a number uh, based on the temperature. So what you really need to look at is how is the capacity changing? And when the capacity starts degrading and gets to that point when you need to switch to annual testing, that, that's, when, that's when you'll switch to annual testing. So you won't, uh, you don't necessarily need to go with. Uh, there is no way to get an expected service life just based on the bat temperature at which uh, the batteries are stored. Just, just try to keep it as close to 25 Celsius as possible, uh, so that the the service life is close to what the expected service life is that's that's provided by the manufacturer. All right, next question. Please share some details on low duty cycle versus battery duty cycle. Well, uh, the manufacturers, they, uh, I guess from this question, what they, what the person that asked this question is referring to the battery duty cycle is what the manufacturer can offer on the battery. So, so the battery will have uh, these uh, tables and it will show what the constant currents uh, can the battery do. And uh, well, that is totally different from the load 
beauty cycle that is uh, uh, going to be happening at the at the substation or at the facility, whatever the battery is connected. And the designer, uh, according to those uh, criteria and those uh, parameters that I mentioned in one of the slides about the the aging factor, the service factor, the temperature, uh, all of these considerations, the uh, designer is going to request for a battery or is going to ask for a battery that is uh, um, capable to uh, cover all of that beauty cycle. So, uh, of course, there's a difference there. And, and the idea is that whatever battery is installed, it's, uh, it's going to be able to handle, handle that uh, beauty cycle on, in, the, in the battery, in the substation. All right. Thank you. Next question. Um, the temperature of the capacity test is the temperature of the electrolyte, not the ambient, correct? Yes, that's true. So you need to look at the temperature of the cells. Um, under normal operation, the temperature of the batteries will pretty much be the same as the temperature of the room. But as the battery discharges during the process, the batteries might get a little warmer. So yes, an accurate way of assessing the batteries is to look at the temperature of the batteries and not, not just temperature of the room. All right, next question. Do decay rates change with the increase or decrease of discharge rate? As such, should testing be increased from annually? Is there such a thing as over-testing? So uh, definitely there could be something such as over-testing, and, and that's why the recommendation from the, from the standard. However, if you consider that your maintenance procedures might not be as effective as you think and you want to check if the battery is really deteriorating, uh, well, you, you may be able to run a test or you want to run a test to confirm that. So, um, again, all of these uh, relates to the amount of cycles and, and the conditions of the battery. So, uh, yes, there can be over-testing, but um, the idea is to... Uh, to have a good trending of the battery and, and, and gather the most information that you can uh, every time you do a maintenance. The other thing to consider is that um, the other part of the question was about the, the rates. Uh, so rate has to be the same. The rate of discharge has to be the same every time you test so you can compare the results. Of course, you can change the rate, but it's not going to be a comparable value to whatever you had previously. And um, the other thing that you can consider is uh, instead of running a performance test, you want to probably just check that the battery can do whatever you are expecting it to do, which is the service test. All right, what is your opinion of conductance testing versus capacity testing? So uh, when we talk about uh, conductance testing in, in the standards or the guides, the term ohmic testing is used and there are different ways of doing ohmic testing. Uh, what we promote is impedance testing, that there's also conductance testing or resistance testing uh, done. Uh, so if you if I had to talk about impedance testing versus capacity testing, uh, both, both look at two different uh, things. Impedance testing is a check of the electrical path uh, in, the, in the system. So what you do is you measure the impedance of the cells, uh, you measure the resistance of the straps connecting those cells, um, you measure the DC voltage. So uh, you basically get an idea of, of the, the condition of the electrical path. If, if there is, uh, let's say, if there is deterioration on the, on the plates, uh, if there's corrosion on the plates, you will get higher strap resistances. If you if there is anything happening inside the cell, you'll get, you might get higher impedance values. If there are shorted cells inside, you might get lower impedance values. So that kind of information is provided by impedance testing. Capacity testing, on the other hand, is it gives you an idea of the true, uh, true capacity of the battery, right? So you are actually uh, drawing current from the battery, which is ultimately the, the objective of the battery. The battery is supposed to provide power to the loads in the case of an outage. So you are simulating uh, an outage. You are drawing a current, a certain current from the battery, and you're observing whether the battery will be able to provide a sustained power to the load for for the duration that it's supposed to. So capacity testing is uh, of higher value as compared to impedance testing, but uh, in a in a good 
maintenance program, you can have both tests complementing each other. Uh, capacity testing requires a lot of effort uh, and time. You need uh, you need to have backup batteries in case you don't have one. You need to make arrangements for those uh, to be able to do testing. So. Uh, on the other hand, impedance testing is uh, easier to carry out. You don't need to take the battery off service. It's still online. You're just taking measurements on the battery bank. So impedance testing can be done more frequently uh, at regular intervals in between capacity tests. So even when you're not doing a capacity test, you're still tracking the condition of the battery and you still have some information uh, in the intervals between capacity tests. So you can have both tests as part of your ma battery maintenance program. All right. Uh, do you prefer adjusting rate or time based on temperature? So uh, from this, this is referring to the two methods that are available to calculate the capacity. And, and uh, the, the main aspect is not uh, probably about preference, but it's about uh, how long is the test going to be? Or what is the expectation of the duration of the test? So. Uh, as indicated during the presentation, the time-adjusted method is for tests uh, longer than one hour, uh, and uh, the recommended method for tests uh, shorter than one hour is the rate-adjusted method. However, um, the rate-adjusted method is uh, uh, with, will come up with a higher accuracy results and uh, it can be used also for the time-adjuster or for tests longer than one hour. So uh, the difficulty there is that you need to consider for the rate adjusted method, the uh, aging factor of the battery. Uh, you can assume 80% uh, is the aging factor of the, of the battery. However, um, this is better to have uh, information from the manufacturer and sometimes this uh, uh, is not easy to get or uh, the method itself includes uh, or considers some or has some difficulties. So people used to prefer to use the, the time adjusted method, which is uh, easier to to use and to uh, applicate, to apply. All right, next question. Um, in a battery bank while performing a capacity test, uh, say batteries number 18 of 60, voltage drops very low. Do you abandon the test or continue? How should we prepare for a retest? Replace number 18 first, or are other options available? So during a capacity test, uh, the guide allows you to pause the test. It's called, the period is called a downtime period. So you're allowed to pause the test once during the duration of the test, and the maximum duration of downtime allowed is six minutes, basically. Uh, so in this six minutes pause, you, you don't you get to decide when you pause the test. Only one pause is allowed, but you get to decide when to do that. So it's it's entirely up to you. Uh, if you have the right equipment, you'll be able to monitor uh, individual cell voltages continuously in real time. And when you see a cell going uh, approaching polarity reversal, which is one volt, that's when you can choose to uh, take a downtime. And if you have multiple cells approaching that condition, you can bypass multiple cells. So it's up to you how you go about it. Uh, when you take that pause is also up to you. So you'll need to monitor uh, the cell voltages continuously to be able to do that, uh, to be able to choose the best time to take, the, uh, take that pause. Uh, so what you will do is when, if you, if you pick out the cells that you need to bypass, uh, you take that downtime and you will uh, bypass those cells and then you can resume the test uh, and then uh, continue. But what you will need to do is, and this is one of the other questions that has been asked by one of our uh, listeners, uh, you will need to change the uh, end voltage now because now if you have taken two cells out of the equation, then you have 58 cells. So the end voltage is going to change based on that. So it might be 58 times 1.75 instead of 60 times 1.75. Uh, so that needs to be done. Okay. Uh, next question. Why measure floating voltage? The float voltage is simply a result of the battery charger output. The open circuit voltage will be less than float voltage. Wouldn't this be the more appropriate voltage to refer to? So definitely the, the open circuit voltage is, is very important. And uh, as I mentioned briefly during the presentation, 
uh, one of the reasons to measure the float voltage is uh, that you can compare, you can see if there's any drastic drop in the voltage of the cell when you uh, disconnect the charger. So if there's any difference or high difference between the float voltage and the open circuit voltage, this might be an indication that the battery or that specific cell uh, might uh, not uh, perform well during the test. So probably before you even starting the test, you can bypass that cell or you can take some actions before running the test. So it's it's kind of a, um, a very comprehensive test that you're running here. You're not just running the, the test to measure the capacity. And, and that's why I was also mentioning that uh, there's a lot of information in the test that you can use to analyze your results farther or beyond the, the capacity result. Uh, another thing to consider is that the float voltage uh, is, uh, it's, it's really a test on the charger. You are verifying that your charger is properly set. Uh, a battery that it's not uh, charged at the right voltage might be uh, affected by that condition. So you can accelerate the one of the failure modes, which is the the corrosion, positive plate corrosion, if the battery is uh, overcharged or floating at a higher voltage than the recommended, or you can also uh, accelerate uh, the sulfation failure mode, which is uh, the condition of a battery that is undercharged. So uh, as a person that is going to review the result or a test report that was not present at the moment of the test, you want to know um, what is the condition of the charger? What is the condition of the cells prior to starting the test? And, and that's what these two measurements will, will give you. Uh, so you have very good criteria when reviewing the result and when reviewing the, the, the report. All right, next question. Can the battery charger alone supply all the DC loads momentarily? Is it acceptable to supply all DC loads with the charger only, say, for one hour without the backup or standby battery connected? So, um, yes, the charger, the battery, the battery charger is uh, um, supposedly uh, capable to do the entire load of the substation. And that's what actually it does when, when it is under normal operation, that the charger is supplying the load and it's supplying a little bit more so it can maintain the charge on the battery. So that's what the floating condition is, that it will supply uh, voltage and current for the, for the load and the battery at the same time. So yes, the charger can be uh, used to support the substation or the facility uh, when the battery is not there, but then you're risking the, if something happens, if there is any power failure, uh, you're going to lose the, the charger and, and you're going to lose the facility because there's no battery to su support that. So that's when the need of the, of the backup battery comes in, depending on the criticality of your installation or if you definitely cannot have the uh, load without any power, you don't want to risk that. So you want to install a, a temporary backup. All right, next question. Uh, when performing the capacity test or load test, is the battery totally disconnected from the DC system? So, uh, as Wally just said, it's important to have a backup battery uh, in, if you're expect, um, just, just to be safe from an outage. Uh, but let's say you have a load, you don't have a backup battery, and you want to do a discharge test on, on a battery bank. You can do that. Uh, the battery will be disconnected from the charger, of course, because you don't want to be discharging the battery while it's being charged at the same time, right? So you will need to disconnect the charger, but it can still be connected to a load uh, while you, I, I can speak for, for the equipment that we make, uh, you can have a CT with which you can measure the current that's being drawn by the load. And then uh, whatever current we need to draw for the discharge test, uh, the, the CT will measure the current that's being drawn by the load and that will be subtracted from the current that, that we need to draw during the discharge test. So the, the load bank will draw the, the remaining amount of current and that current will be regulated as the test progresses. So you don't need to be disconnected from everything. You need to be disconnected from the charger. 
but whatever the current that is being drawn by the load during the discharge test, the, the load in your system, that can be taken into account um, and that, that can be included as part of the discharge test current. All right, uh, the next question. Does the mega torquil unit allow you to change your end of test voltage mid-test in the event you need to pause the test to bypass the defective cell? Uh, yes, and this, this again goes back to um, a couple of questions ago when we talked about uh, taking the downtime or, or pausing the test for, for six minutes. Uh, when you do that, when you take the cells out, you need to adjust the end voltage based on the number of cells that you have taken out. And yes, uh, our software allows you to do that. At any point during the test, you can change the warning limits or the stop limits uh, that, that can be done while the test is on. All right, thank you, Sanket. Um, unfortunately, we have hit our one and a half hour mark with our 30-minute uh, Q&A session now. Um, we have actually received almost 80 questions. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna try and get back to answering these questions and get some answers out to you guys. Um, but at this time, we're gonna go ahead and close the webinar. Again, you will receive a copy of uh, the presentation today as well as a link to this video. So you can go back and watch the recording uh, at any time later on or share it with your uh, colleagues. Um, we'd like to thank you all for attending and uh, hope you have a great weekend.